So where are we in the Bible? We're on a three-year journey through the Old Testament. It was going to be three years through the entire Bible, but we just couldn't get through it that fast. So we're going to finish the Old Testament this spring by June. And then next fall, we're going to jump into the New Testament, and our Milford campus is going to join us, and we're all going to walk through the life of Jesus and the life of the early church uh, come next fall. Our small groups are going to study it together. It's going to be a great journey. But we're, we're kind of marching toward the end of the Old Testament, and today we come to one of the major prophets. There are four major prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a very, very interesting character. To understand the message of Ezekiel, which we'll look at this week and next week, you have to understand the original marriage that God made with the nation Israel. And you go all the way back, Ezekiel's living about 550 B.C., but if you go back a thousand years before him to like 1500 B.C., you find Moses bringing the nation Israel out of Egypt through the Exodus, the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea, and all of that. And they come to Mount Sinai where God stops the nation for one entire year, and he enters into a covenant relationship with them. Uh, You might have heard of the Ten Commandments. Well, actually, that's the prologue to an entire book of commandments, something like 683 positive and negative commandments in the book of Exodus and other books of the Old Testament. And what it was was a covenant relationship, a marriage between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the people. And he committed to be their God, and they would be his priests in the world, serving him, representing him to the world. But throughout the Old Testament, it was likened to a marriage. And in the very introduction to this covenant relationship, the Ten Commandments, the very first two commandments sort of spell out what God expected. And he basically said, he said in in chapter 20 of Exodus, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods besides me. In other words, it's a marriage. And like in a marriage, you say, Uh, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Nobody comes between this relationship. It's exclusive. And sometimes in wedding ceremonies, you'll hear the line, forsaking all others, I commit myself only unto you. And that's what God was saying. And, And then he said this in the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself idols in the form of anything in heaven above, like no idols representing the sun or the moon or the stars, No idols of angels or anything up there, nor anything on the earth beneath or even in the waters. In other words, no idols of of snakes or crawling things or alligators or bears or lions or fish, nothing. No idols. And then he said this, you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God. I'm a jealous God. To understand the book of Ezekiel a thousand years later, you have to understand that phrase, jealous God. I'm a jealous God. In the Bible, there are two kinds of jealousy. There's sinful jealousy where you want something that's not yours. Uh, You covet something. That's sinful jealousy. You want something that's not yours. But then there's righteous jealousy where you want something that is yours. So, If you're married, you should be protective of that relationship. You should jealously desire the commitment and mutual affection of your spouse. Uh, You should jealously desire the protection of your family, your children. And if, if anybody comes and messes with your family, you're going to jealously protect your family because that's your family. You have a right to be jealous over some things, right? That's godly jealousy. And God says in Exodus, look, I'm entering into this relationship with you, but you have to know something. I'm jealous for you. I don't want any competition. I don't want anybody coming in between us, you know, forsaking all others. Keep yourself only unto me, God. And at the end of the book of Exodus, God moves in. He, he, during that year, he had Moses and friends build a tabernacle, a temporary temple that they would carry with them through the wilderness into the promised land, later to be replaced by a permanent temple. 
But at the end of the book of Exodus, the very last chapter, they set up the temple, and it says the glory of God came and moved into the temple. And they all stood back. They had to get back because of this shining, glorious fire, this presence of God came to dwell right inside that tabernacle. And it was like God saying, I'm moving in with you. We're married now. I'm making house together with you. And, and years later, when Solomon, King Solomon, the son of David, built a physical temple in Jerusalem to replace that tent, the exact same thing happened. The glory of God kind of showed up and invaded the physical space. And God was saying to his people, I'm yours, you are mine, we're in love, we, we share the house together, this is, this is us. And to understand the book of Ezekiel, you have to understand that God is about to move out. God is about to move out. Ezekiel is 950 years from Moses, and God, if you've been following with, the, with us through the Old Testament, God has been patient. I mean, he's been staying with his beloved, even though she has failed the covenant, broken the vows, run off with idols, devoted herself to, to Molech the god or Ashtaroth the god that, that requires the sacrifice of your infants, uh, to Baal, to, and, and, and running off to other nations for help and security like Assyria or Egypt or wherever. And for 950 years, God has stuck in there. He's held, held on and He's been loyal and faithful and protective. And finally, through Ezekiel, God says, I've got to move out. Now, um, maybe you've experienced this where you've been in a relationship, and because the relationship was hurtful or harmful or dangerous or abusive, you've had to create space. And you understand how hard that is when you love someone and it comes to the point where it's so destructive for you and for them and for everybody that you have to create space. Maybe it's a business relationship where you finally just have to create space because it's just not right. Or maybe it's your group of friends at school and, and finally you just realize, you know what? They're leading me down a bad path and I, I just can't go that way. I gotta create some space. And you've had to separate. God says to Israel, you know what, I gotta create some space. I'm sorry to say it, but I gotta create some space. I gotta move out because this is destructive. And that is what happens with the prophet Ezekiel. He's actually, he's 30 years old and he's actually living in captivity in Babylon because what had happened is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had come in three waves against the nation Israel and attacked Israel and gradually taken Israel captive. And the final captivity and destruction of Jerusalem wouldn't happen until the year 586 when Nebuchadnezzar would come, destroy the temple, destroy the city, burn it to the ground. 11 years before that happened, Ezekiel was taken into captivity into Babylon as one of the Jewish exiles. Daniel was taken earlier um, and Ezekiel was in captivity. And so Ezekiel is raised up by God to tell the nation why He's moving out. And it's not an easy message. It's one of the most difficult messages in the Bible. And it, it's a, a little bit, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's a little bit of a downer because God doesn't move out for just any old reason. He moves out because things are wrong in the hearts of people. And, to, and today, just to kind of pre-apply this to tell you how it's gonna apply, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, or 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So now God doesn't dwell like in houses made with human hands. He dwells in human hearts. And it says in the book of James, chapter 4, uh, James is writing to a group of people who are kind of flirting with the world and getting involved in all kinds of things. And James writes... You adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is adultery with God? Do you not know that he jealously desires the spirit he has made to dwell in you? So the principle's exactly the same. The place has changed. It's not a temple made with hands, it's you. But the principle of God's jealous desire to have it all, we just sang it, and we sang that song on purpose. You can have it all, Lord. 
Because the question today is, is that true? Is that really true? Or does some other idol have parts of your heart? And is that creating jealousy? So, so God says to Ezekiel, I've called you up to challenge the nation and to let them know why I have to move out. And here's what God says to Ezekiel. He says, it's not going to be easy. He says, son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites. And as I read this passage, see if you can pick up the key word that God has to describe this people. I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, don't be afraid of them or their words. Don't be afraid. Even though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. In other words, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be like living among snakes and scorpions. They're going to be after you. But don't be afraid. Though they are rebellious people, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And then God gave them a, a scroll to eat with God's words for the nation. Do you pick up the key phrase that God uses to describe his people? Over and over, just rebellious, 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 revolt. They're rebellious, they've rebelled, they've rebelled. Ten times in this chapter, two, which only has eight verses in it, ten times God uses words, they've revolted, they've rebelled, they've thrown off my, my, my love for them. And to understand the whole book of Ezekiel, you have to understand the name that God uses for himself throughout this book as he declares his zeal and his jealousy over his people. He uses a name for himself that's actually two names put together that in this book of Ezekiel, it's used 210 times. Now that, as a Bible student, when you see one writer emphasize one name 210 times, and then you compare to other books of the Bible, and Jeremiah uses it like 10 times, and Isaiah uses it like two times. You go, what's up with this name? And then when you realize that Bible translations struggle over how to even translate this name, you know you're on to something that's key to Ezekiel. And the name is two names of God in the Old Testament. The first is Adonai, and that's often translated God or Lord with small case letters. And then the second part of the name is Yahweh, which is God's covenant name for the, with the nation Israel. My name is Yahweh, which, which is, is really, it's translated Lord in most translations, but with capital letters. So Bible translators look at this and they say, what's going on here? It's like, it's like what do we call them? God Lord? Thus says God Lord? Or should we translate it? Thus says, Lord, capital letters, Lord, capital, or small letters, capital letters. That would read weird. Thus says, Lord, Lord. So translators are struggling. What do we do with this? The New International Version gets it best. Got to give them the award here for the translators. They translate it 210 times. Thus says, the sovereign Lord. Because the word Adonai means king. It means my gracious master. And, and what God is saying to his people through here when he keeps you know, calling them to himself and calling out their sin, he's saying, look, I am the king, Yahweh. I am the sovereign Lord. I'm the uncontested Lord of your lives, or supposed to be. The so a sovereign has no contestants. A sovereign has complete rule and authority. If God is sovereign in your life, it means he can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants, and you simply say you are sovereign. And so 210 times, thus saith sovereign Yahweh, I'm moving out. Why? 
because they did not want him to be sovereign, Yahweh, in their lives. They wanted to have other things they flirted with, other gods they played with, other priorities they put in front of sovereign. And so he says, regretfully, because you won't let me be king, Yahweh, because you want me to be God with a small g or Lord with a small l, because you want to fit me in with all your other gods and goddesses, I'm moving out. And that's Ezekiel's message to the nation in a nutshell. The way it comes to the nation is so interesting. Um, he's, he's in captivity, and this group of elders come to him to ask him what's happening back in Jerusalem, because they're their descendants and their children were still back there, and Nebuchadnezzar, you know, it's like 11 more years before the final destruction, so they're like, what's going on back there? Can you tell us? Has God told you? And what's going to happen in the future? So as he's sitting there with the elders, God lifts him up in a vision and takes him to Jerusalem and shows him exactly what's happening. And, and God shows Ezekiel why God has to move out. And he shows them groups of people. And, and we're going to look at these and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. The first thing he sees, he's taken back to the temple, to the north part of the temple. And God says, son of man, look toward the north. And so I looked and at the entrance of the north gate of the altar, I saw the idol of jealousy. At the idol of jealousy. And he said to me, God said, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here. These are the things that will drive me far away from my house. These are the things that are going to make me leave my house. Do you see what's going on right here in my house? They're worshiping the idol of jealousy. Now, that's not what the people called it. They didn't say to their friends, let's go up and worship the idol of jealousy. No, it was some other idol like Baal or Molech or Ashtaroth, and they were offering their children, their babies, which is hard to imagine. My wife was just down here totally distracted because there's two twin boys who are 10 weeks old, and she was holding one of them, and she looked at me, and she says, I want one. <laughs> That's how I pray you get one. Can you imagine being that mother and going to an idol in Jerusalem and dropping that 10-week-old baby down a stone slide into the fiery belly of Molech. That's what was happening. And God says, do you see them committing this abomination, this idol that drives me crazy? And later in the book, he says, you're offering my children to these idols. God calls them my children. The idol of jealousy, the idol that drives God jealous. So I ask you a question. What's your idol that causes God to be jealous for you? I think we all have idols. That's why the Apostle John in the New Testament says to Christians, little children, guard yourselves from idols. That's his very last line in 1 John chapter 5. Why would you end with that? Because everybody has idols, things that get our attention, things that turn our eyes from God, things we spend way too much time on, things we look at and we just say, wow, I really like you. And God gives us these things to enjoy. He gives us work. He gives us toys. He gives us hobbies. He gives us people. He gives us wives and husbands, little babies. But have they taken God's place? Is it like God's looking at you just going, that's driving me crazy. Do you have an idol of jealousy today? Where God looks and he just says, it's too big in your life. It's too big. It's an idol that causes me to be jealous. I think we all have them. But we have, to, we have to really ask God, what is it? Then, he, then he's brought over to the temple in vision still. This is still in a vision. And God says, see that little hole in the wall of the temple? Dig through it and creep into the inner room. Because there's something going on in the inner room I want you to see. So Ezekiel, all in a vision, gets down, digs out this hole, and crawls into this inner room in the temple. And he sees the second thing that's driving God crazy. So I went in and I looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls all kinds of crawling things. Like portrayed on the walls, I saw snakes, I saw worms, I saw caterpillars, I saw unclean animals, and I saw all the idols of Israel 
And in front of them stood 70 elders of Israel. These are the leaders of the land. These are the fathers of the land. These are the governors, the princes, the rulers. They're hiding in this room. Each had a censer in his hand. And a censer is this metal dish, bronze usually. And they would put coals from the altar in it and then sprinkle incense. And the, the incense would go up to appease the God. And there's 70 leaders of Israel standing in front of a wall with snakes and caterpillars carved on it, and they're offering up incense. And God sees it, and he says to Ezekiel, do you see this? Do you see this? He said, son of man, have you seen what the leaders of the nation are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? And they say, the Lord doesn't see us. The Lord's left the land. We're okay. We're in the dark. Nobody knows what we're doing. We're hiding here. We're safe. God sees the idols. He sees our secret sins. So I ask you this morning, I ask myself, what's the secret sin? What's the sin you commit in the darkness and God doesn't see, nobody else sees, it's my own little thing. Nobody, Nobody knows about this. Yeah, other people might have to dig a hole in the wall and sneak in to catch you doing that, but you know what, God says, it's breaking my heart. The things you do in the darkness are completely in the light to me, and it's just, you know, our God is a God of mercy. 950 years, he persisted with these people trying to cleanse them from all these secret sins. He'll cleanse us, but if we want to stay in the darkness, he'll, he'll, he'll just let it take us out. He'll just let it take us out. And you're seeing leaders all across our nation being taken out by their secret sins because the women who have experienced some of this are saying it's not going to be a secret anymore. I'm going to blow the whistle. And I don't care if it was 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago. You touched me and I'm telling now. And people are just going, oh no. The secret things I did in the darkness are coming out. And they should come out. But you know what? If you bring them out into the light, God will heal because that's the kind of God he is. But these leaders are hiding away saying, God doesn't see us. We're going to worship these little worms on the wall. God says, it's breaking my heart, breaking my heart. The third thing he sees, he says, come on over here. It's not just the men and those guys. Look at this group of women over here. They're weeping for Tammuz. They're weeping for Tammuz. And he goes, and God brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. There's different parts all around God's house, the temple. It'd be like this happening on the porch of Oak Point. And, and they're worshiping, sitting there worshiping and weeping for Tammuz. You say, well, who's Tammuz? It's a great question. Tammuz was the Babylonian god of fertility. And the, the tradition about Tammuz, the legend was that every spring, when the weather started to get real dry and there were drought conditions in Israel and Babylon, that Tammuz had died and gone into the underworld. So how do you get Tammuz to rise from the dead in the fall and bring the rains back? You weep for Tammuz. You get with Tammuz and you cry out and you cut yourself and you bleed and you cry out, Tammuz, bring back the rains, bring back the productivity, bring back children, bring back fertility. And God sees women weeping for Tammuz and it breaks his heart. He says to Ezekiel, that's why I got to move out. That's why I got... What's the Tammuz you weep for today? I mean, I, you, don't, you don't sit out in the front of Oak Point weeping over some Babylonian god, but maybe you weep when other sources of productivity kind of falter. And you, know, you look at the Dow, and all of a sudden it goes down, and you start weeping for the Dow. Oh, Dow. Oh, traders, please come back. And you see pictures of people holding their head on Wall Street, and you're going, yeah, that's how I feel too. You're weeping for Tammuz. Or your business takes a bump and you start to weep for Tammuz or you say, oh, my health, you know. God just says, why don't you look to me like Doris? Why don't you just tell the church to pray to me? I'm better than Tammuz. I can, in my sovereign way, I can provide for you. I can protect you. I can take you through suffering. Tammuz is nothing. Why are you weeping for Tammuz? So today I just ask you, What's your Tammuz that you're trusting in, your source of hope and security and happiness and fertility? Is it, is it God or is it some modern form of Tammuz? Because it breaks God's heart. One of his names in the Old Testament is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord 
is our provider. He wants to be your provider. It's not Tammuz. And then he sees 25 priests in the temple, and this is kind of shocking. Uh, he, he's taken to the inner court of the house of the Lord. Now, the inner court is right before you get to the Holy of Holies where God's glory dwelt, and in the inner court, that's where only the priests could go. And there were 24 courses of Jewish priests, two from each of the 12 tribes, and they rotated during the year to serve God in that inner court. So there are 24 of them, and then one high priest over them all. So the fact that he, he brings them to the inner court, and there at the entrance of the temple, uh, between the portico and the altar were 25 men. That's the spiritual leaders of the nation. That's the 24 Levitical priests and the high priests their head. This is the spiritual elite of the whole nation. In the inner court of the temple, and what does Ezekiel see? And there they were with their backs toward the temple and their faces toward the east, and they were bowing down to the sun. Bowing to the sun. The sun. Because the sun in the ancient world for many nations was considered to be the sovereign Lord. Why? Because the sun was the brightest and biggest thing in the sky. And so the Egyptians worshiped the sun, God, Re, R-E, as the sovereign Lord. And, and, and God takes these Ezekiel in and says, look at these 25 spiritual leaders. They are worshiping the sovereign sun. And you, did you see how it's interested in the wording? They had their backs toward the temple of Yahweh. So they should be leading the nation. The priests were to stand between God and men and bring the nation to Yahweh. And they, forget about that one, let's worship the sun. I ask you today, are there ways you've turned your back on God? You know, you used to be a worshiper of God, you used to be more passionate, more fervent, but in some ways you've, you've kind of lost that, you've lost your first love, and instead of running toward God, you find yourself running toward the sun or some other pursuit, and God's kind of like, you know, you've turned your back on me. You've turned your back. If you turned your back on God, it breaks his heart. It's not an unforgivable sin. None of these are the unforgivable sin. None of these. The only unforgivable sin is the sin that you don't want to be forgiven. And God says, I if you don't want to be forgiven, it won't be for forgiven. But all of these are forgivable, and God would restore and heal, but they're running toward the sun. And then there's one group of people who have repented. One group of people that Ezekiel is allowed to see, and God says, look at these people. Look at these people. And God sent out an angel, and he said to the angel, go throughout the city of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and groan over all the detestable things that are done in it. I love that because that means God sees the individual people who don't like what's going on. And even though they don't have the power to change what the 25 priests or the 70 elders or the women weeping for Tammuz or anybody else is doing, they don't like it. And God sees them weeping over it. And God sees their heart break over it. You know what? If that's you today, you're right with God. You're right in the right place because God says, that's my heart too. And so I ask you, is your heart weeping and breaking over certain things in your own life? Jesus said in the, in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And he wasn't talking about just mourning over anything. Because right before he said, blessed are those who, poor in, who are poor in spirit. And if you recognize your poverty of spirit, and you recognize the junk going on in our culture, and you recognize all the evil, and it breaks your heart, God says, I'm putting a good mark on you because that's exactly my heart. God loves that. Is that you today? Do you weep and mourn for Tammuz, or do you weep and mourn over the iniquity in your own heart and the heart of the nation? Then there's 25 more people who, they're leaders, they're princes, and God says to Ezekiel, look at these guys, 25 leaders. These are men who devise iniquity. They give evil advice in this city. They say to the people, is not the time near to build houses? Yeah, well, they are multiplying the dead in the city, filling its streets with blood. They're called men of bloodshed. Why? Because they're, they're giving people false counsel. Instead of saying, listen to Ezekiel, or Jeremiah was alive prophesying back in Jerusalem at this very time. Instead of saying, you know what? 
God's going to judge us and we need to submit to his discipline. They're saying, oh, it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. They give evil advice and they fill the streets with blood because they lead people away from God's word and God's will. They give evil advice. So I ask you, you're a leader. You have a business. You have a family. You have kids. You have a spouse. You have a Sunday school class you teach. You have people at school. You're a leader. You have a team. Do you give words of advice that point people toward life, toward God? Are you a source? Are you a source of the kinds of words that lead to life and you bring truth to God, truth about God to people? Or are you bringing words that lead people away, filling the streets with bloodshed? That's why God's going to leave because the leaders are steering people away from God instead of toward God. And then he, he sees prophets like himself, and the prophets aren't even doing their job. Here's what God says to Ezekiel about the other prophets. Because they lead my people astray, say, peace, peace, when there is no peace, and because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it over with whitewash, therefore tell those who cover it over with whitewash, it's going to fall. It's going to fall. When the wall collapses, won't people ask, where's the whitewash? Where's the plaster we covered it with? God says, here's the prophets. They're plastering over cracks instead of fixing real issues, instead of really getting to the root of people. They're afraid to tell people what they need to hear. They tell people what they want to hear. They make everybody feel really good, and they're plastering over deadly cracks with whitewash, and that's why I'm leaving. Because even the prophets won't say what's necessary. Even the pastors of the land won't say what's necessary. They'll just have church service after church service after church service where they tell people what they want to hear. And God says, that's why I'm leaving. That's why I'm leaving. Ezekiel was different. Jeremiah was different. Daniel was different. They would tell people what God, whatever God said. But God says, I'm leaving. How about you? Maybe you're not like a prophet, but you plaster over the cracks in your life with, with whitewash, just saying, you know what, I'm going to minimize, deny, blame, rationalize this issue. I'm not getting to the root of that. I'll, I'll just keep going. I'll just plaster over that problem. I'm not going to take any of the classes they talk about at Oak Point, you know, loving well, listening well, loving well. Those, those, those classes that Bob Cops keeps talking about get beneath the iceberg to the real root issues. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to keep, keep, it, keep it cool above the surface. Whitewash. God says, you know, that's deadly to plaster over a fatal crack with whitewash. And then the last group are the elders who are sitting there with Ezekiel. And, and, and you'd think they were the one group that would be good. They're in exile with Ezekiel. They've come to his house. They want to talk to him. And it says, the elders of Israel came to me, sat down in front of me, and the Lord said to me, son of man, these guys sitting right in front of you have set up their idols in their hearts. And they have put the wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I even let them inquire of me at all? Should I even let them be here talking to you? Because they've already got the idols determined in their hearts. And I find that so fascinating because these are the people that at least look like they were going along with God. They've come to Ezekiel's house. They've come to Oak Point Church. They take in the sermons. They listen to the words. And God's looking and going, why am I even letting them come in here? They, they, they've already decided they got their idols set up in their hearts. And I ask you, I ask me, does God look at me and say, you already got your idols set up in your hearts. What are you doing there? What are you doing there? Should I let you sing my songs at all? Because you've already set up idols in your hearts that are singing a completely different song. Do you have idols set up in your hearts? Even though you're sitting right here, right now, listening to an elder, are you, in your heart, an idolater? I think we all are. You see, that's the problem. We all are. And God wants to cleanse us. God wants to heal us. But Israel would not have it. And so he said, I'm leaving. And all throughout this thing, Ezekiel sees the glory of God moving by stages out of the city. And, and the elders and, and rabbis who studied this, Jewish rabbis, they saw 10 successive stages throughout these chapters where God is reluctantly departing from his beloved not just like, boom, I'm gone. Stages, slow, steady, reluctant, leaving his beloved. But before he goes, God says something that'll blow your mind. This, will, this, 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 because I mean, with everything you've just seen, what should God say on his way out? 
He should just say, see you later. I've had 950 years of waiting for you. I'll see you later. You know what God says on his way out? Then the Lord God said, I'm going to gather you, you exiles. I'm gonna gather you from the peoples. I'm gonna assemble you out of the countries among which you've been scattered, and I'm gonna give you the land again. I'm gonna give you the land of Israel again. And when they come there, they will remove all the detestable things, its abominations from it, and I'm gonna give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I'll take the heart of stone out of their flesh. I'm gonna give them a heart of flesh. Then they're gonna walk in my statutes. They're gonna keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people, and I will be their God. Then God says, now I'm leaving. But before he leaves, he says, I'm not done with you. This is a separation that's necessary, but this is not a divorce. I'm not done with you. And there's a day coming, my beloved Israel, where after this period of discipline, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna just, I'm gonna do surgery in your hearts and I'm gonna give you a heart to love me again. This is the constant theme of the prophets. Even though God says, it's time for some justice. God says, my faithfulness, I will never break my covenant with you. And he says, I'm coming back. And then in the final scene, chapter 11, verse 23, then the glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of the city. That's the Mount of Olives the very mountain from which Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, the very mountain where it says in the book of Zechariah and in the New Testament, Jesus said, that's the mountain I will return to someday at my second coming. That's the mountain. Ezekiel saw the glory of God hover up there. And it's almost like the, the, the lover has had enough and has to separate. So the lover gets in the car and, and the, the, the unfaithful is just standing at the door. It's like, don't leave, don't leave. And, and the lover just drives down the street. It gets to the end of the street. And before the lover disappears around the corner, the car stops. And, and the window goes down. And from a distance, the unfaithful one can see the reluctance, can see, can see the one who's having to leave just stop and take one last loving, longing look before reluctantly the window goes up and the car does it. That's God as he leaves just reluctant, reluctant. It's the last thing on earth he wants to do is walk away from Israel, even for a time. And again, in the New Testament, it says he'll never leave us. And when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, it says you are sealed, you are signed, you are delivered, you are secure, you're God's child. Hebrews 13, five and six, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. But it does say that you can grieve the Holy Spirit, you can quench the Holy Spirit, you can fail to be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit because you just decide you don't want to let him be sovereign Lord. And that's the same kind of thing because now you're just limiting God's work and power in your life. We do that all the time. We grieve the Holy Spirit. He doesn't leave like he did here, but he can be quenched. And then the final thing that happens that shows the faithfulness of Ezekiel, it's just almost hard to believe this happens. But God says to the prophet, I called you to be my spokesman, and now I want to act out how I feel with my bride through you. And Ezekiel's like, well, okay. And on the very day, so now you jump forward and you're, you're about a year and a half from the very destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar comes with all his troops, and for a year and a half he lays siege to the city. He surrounds it and begins to starve them out. On the day that his army lays siege, here's what God says for Ezekiel. Shocking. Prepare yourself. The extent to which God will go to give his message to his people is shocking. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, with one blow, I am about to take from you the delight of your eyes. Now understand God is about to lose the delight of his eyes. Jerusalem, his people, the temple, all of that, as Nebuchadnezzar uh, takes it and just crushes it. But God says, I need to illustrate how I feel. So I'm gonna take the delight of your eyes. You're going like, what's the delight of Ezekiel's eyes? And yet, when I do this, I don't want you to lament or weep or shed any tears because this is necessary. This judgment that's gonna happen on my beloved, it's necessary. Groan quietly when I strike the delight of your eyes. Don't mourn for the dead. Someone's gonna die. 
That's the delight of Ezekiel's eye. Keep your turban fastened on your head, your sandals on your feet. Don't cover your mustache or beard or eat the customary food of mourners. Don't have a funeral. Don't cry because I'm not going to. When my beloved dies, the delight of my eyes, don't cry. So I spoke to the people in the morning, Ezekiel said, in the evening, my wife died. Can you believe that? You go back to the beginning, son of man, with one blow, I am about to take away the delight of your eyes. That night, his wife died. Ezekiel knew exactly who did it. I might have quit at that point. I mean, Hosea, go marry a prostitute so I can illustrate that I'm married to an unfaithful nation. Okay, I'll do that. Caused me a lot of pain, but I'll do it. Ezekiel, lay on your left side for 390 days straight to illustrate the 390 years I've been waiting for these people to turn around. Okay, I'll lay on my side. I mean, I might have some bed sores. 390 days, that's a long time. Ezekiel, I'm taking your wife tonight, and you can't have a funeral tomorrow. said, okay. So in the morning, he preached. In the evening, his wife died. And then the people came. The people came. The next morning, I did as I had been commanded. I didn't have a funeral. And the people said, what are you doing? Tell us what these things mean. Why are you acting like this? I said, well, the word of the Lord came to me. Say to the people of Israel, this is what sovereign Lord says. This is what king above all kings, Lord, says. This is what he says. I'm about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection, the city of Jerusalem, the temple, your sons, your daughters, your relatives who live back there. The sons and daughters you left behind are going to fall by the sword, and you will do as I have done. You will not cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary food of mourners when you get the news that it's all gone, it's all done. No funeral, no mourning. You'll keep your turbans on, your heads, your sandals on your feet. You won't mourn or weep, but you will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourselves. And you will groan among yourselves and basically say, why did we, why did we bring this on ourselves. Because God said, that's the problem. I didn't move. I never moved. But you moved. You walked away from me. You won't mourn or weep. You'll waste away because of your sins. And Ezekiel will be assigned to you, and you'll do just as he has done. And when this happens, you will know that I am sovereign Lord. See, the whole point of the book is God's trying to say, I'm sovereign, Lord, and you've rejected it, and you, you've just told me too many times, no. I don't want you to be king in my life. You can be God with a small g. That's how this section ends. Next week, you're going to see the glory of God returning. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of restoration. But right now, we'll leave it right there. Ezekiel's wife has died, and God says no funeral because my people have gone so far that I'm leaving, and they're going down. What would bring God to that point? It's just our own, our own unconfessed, unrepentant idolatries and sins that we just won't admit. And so I say to you, first I say to you, I wanted to avoid this message all week. I hated this message. And then God finally said, if you avoid this message, you're doing exactly what I told Ezekiel not to do, and that is not to avoid the message. <laughs> so I thought, oh yeah, that would be ironic if, if I was unwilling to give the message of Ezekiel, which you told him he had to deliver, even though it was a message he didn't want to deliver. So I thought, well, I just better go with it and let God be God, and let God minister it. And all I can say to you at the end of this, God is a merciful God. He wants to forgive. 
He waited around for 950 years before he said, I'm taking a break. And even as he took a break, he said, I'll be back. So God is a God of love and mercy. It says in Isaiah that judgment is his unusual work. And so I just want to say to you today, God wants to give this message to you because he just wants to do what 1 John chapter 5 says, little children, guard yourselves from idols because the idols will take you nowhere. And it breaks God's heart when you let those idols take you somewhere. We're gonna sing a song right now and it's usually used in the sense of Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. And we, we sang it on the Revere night, Friday night, and we're gonna change the, the meaning a little bit and as you sing it, I want you to sing it with personal intent. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Sing it with personal intent. And offer to God, even as you sing it, the idols, the things you've thought about during this time that are getting way too much of you. Just give them up to God. And let's sing this from our heart. Lord, we offer this moment to you. We're gonna sing, but we don't wanna sing while we cherish idols in our hearts. We actually wanna sing and we wanna give you the idols and we want you, we ask you to be sovereign, uncontested king in our hearts. Right now as we sing, just hear our words and our plea that you would have all of us, our hearts. We just give ourselves to you in Jesus' name.
that. Hey, can we, uh, can we thank our, our guest from Texas? And by the way, here's how you know he's from Texas. It's not his beautiful voice. It's, this is Michigan, Michigan. This is Michigan, the hoodie, everything. This is Texas right here, Texas. I'm glad you got to experience. <laughs> I'm glad you got to experience a true Michigan ice storm. This is like, this is as good as it gets in Michigan. Thanks for being here, Blaze. Lord, we just offer up our hearts to you again. And we pray that uh, as a church community, you would cause us to walk together in grace, humility, holding our, our idols with open hands, saying every day, take this one, take this one. God, take this one, because the idols keep coming. And uh, we just want to be people where you are sovereign. Be sovereign, Lord, in our lives today, this week. Shine through us to our world around us. Cause people to see you through us here in Texas, all around. Be sovereign, Lord, Lord. We commit our hearts to you. Commit our hearts to you, Jesus. Amen. Let's walk out and just sing that one more time. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Amen, amen. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great week.